we're ready, I'm going to, to make a start. Um, my name's Kevin Collins, and I've been invited to uh, chair this session. And I'm, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Robert Plowman, you. who you will know, you'll know of his work, who's going to make a presentation to us all. Um, just to clarify how we're going to handle it, um, while Robert's speaking, or you may have come with questions, we're using this technology of Slido for people to type their questions in, they come up on this screen, they come up on this screen, and as I understand it, people can vote for which questions are most popular, and that gets lifted to the top and all, all that malarkey. I'm not quite sure how we have an interaction, but we're going to do that. That's what we're going to use, this technology. Um, I, I'm, I'm delighted to be asked to chair this session. I, I, I come from a family of six boys and two sets of twins. So one of the... Uh, this is the only time my mother, who's 91, has recently queued and bought the book and had it signed because she wanted to know about understanding these six boys that she's raised and, and why they're so different and all the rest of it. And so the twin study is particularly personally interesting. But apart from that, I also am uh, the chief exec of the Education Endowment Foundation, where we've run nearly 200 randomized control trials with just under 2 million children in England, one in two schools, trying to understand more about how do you make interventions, what do you do, what differences can you make in education to support children, particularly from the most disadvantaged communities. And I think it's great that we're opening up the debate in a scientific way, not only about interventions, but about other domains of, of children's development, children's learning. And I'm really excited to, to, to hear the talk. I don't want to say too much now. I want to let Robert get going. And then um, I'll have my own questions, and you'll have your questions. And I think this is, we're in for a, a really exciting introduction. So over to you, Robert. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes. And um, I, I really look forward to the discussion. It's, it's particularly nice to have Sir Kevin here because uh, he was one of the first people I talked to in the field of education who would talk to me. I mean, education was really quite resistant to genetics for a long time. And I think uh, things have really changed in the last few years, in part thanks to people like Sir Kevin. Um, so do you ever think about what makes you who you are? Um, for 45 years, I've been doing research on genetic and environmental influences in behavior. And um, I'm thinking about, like, personality. Why, why are you sociable or shy? Or mental health and illness? Or cognitive abilities and disabilities? So my book, Blueprint, um, makes the case that um, this is the culmination of my 45 years of research, that inherited DNA differences are the major systematic source making us who we are as individuals. The book is divided in two. The first half is about genetics. So it's how do we know genetics is important, and how important is it, and what are the implications of uh, genetics in psychology particularly. The second half of the book is new stuff, and it's what I want to kind of emphasize today, the DNA revolution, which is called genomics, like the human genome, genomics. And so I'm going to give you a quick overview of this in 20 minutes. And it's tricky because there's an awful lot of material here. But I have the comfort of knowing you do have the book if you're interested in any of this material. I have to start with the most misunderstood concept in genetics called heritability. It's the extent to which inherited DNA differences account for differences in behavior. So it's all about differences. And, um, that's such an important notion, and it relates to the sort of work that um, Kevin does with randomized control trials. We're talking about what makes people different in a population that we study. And 99% of our DNA makes us similar, and that's what makes us human. The, we're talking about the 1% of our 3 billion base pairs of DNA that makes us different. And to what extent do they account for differences in behavior? And there's a lot of important caveats here. And I'm not going to talk about caveats for everything, but this is really important. We're describing what is in a particular population with a particular mix of genetic and environmental influences. We're not talking about what could be in different populations or if we did a randomized control trial. We're looking at the differences as they exist and asking to what extent are genetic and environmental factors important. Because we're studying particular populations, we're describing the normal range of variation. We're not talking about the environmental extremes of abuse, nor are we talking about the genetic extremes 
of single gene mutations that can have devastating effects. We're talking about the normal range that we can study in our, say, um, my samples in the UK. And thirdly, these are probabilistic influences. The problem is we all learn about genetics from Mendel, and those are single gene, hardwired, deterministic um, uh, effects. But here we're talking about common traits that are influenced by many, many genes of small effect, and the effects are probabilistic. They're like tendencies and nudges. They're not deterministic. They're not hardwired. They're probabilistic, so not innate and not immutable. So the first half of the book talks about methods to understand genetic influence and ends up concluding um, with this conclusion about the importance of genetic influences. That is that overall psychological traits, about half of the differences between people can be ascribed to inherited DNA differences. Now that means that environmental influences are important, but the, the harder concept to understand but equally important is the environment works very differently from the way environmentalists thought it worked. It's not the systematic influence of family or schools that we typically mean when we talk about nurture. The important environmental influences are what we call non-shared. That is, they make two kids in the same family going to the same school different from one another. They're important environmental influences, but they don't make kids growing up together similar. We now know, after 30 years of research, that most of these environmental influences are idiosyncratic, you know, specific to one person, stochastic, random, in a word, chance. Stuff happens. And third, what looks like systematic effects of the environment is often um, genetic effects in disguise. So I'll give you an example of that later. But um, the Putting these three things together, the importance of genetics, non-shared environment, and the nature of nurture, comes to the title of the book, which is this idea that DNA is the major systematic force making us and our children who they are. So that's the first half of the book. But I'd like to, because the topic here is implications, I'm not at all an expert in implications and policy the way uh, Kevin is. But um, I'd like to begin by emphasizing that there's no necessary policy implications of finding genetic influence. But there are some interesting implications, and um, one of them that's gotten the most attention, so much attention that I'm writing my next book on this topic, you could see is a bit provocative. Parents matter, but they don't make a difference. So the idea is parents matter a lot. They provide the psychological and physical ingredients that kids need to grow up. But the differences between parents in how they parent doesn't make a long-term difference environmentally. The important differences are non-shared. So two kids, are, uh, you know, two siblings, would be just as similar if they grew up in different environments. And if you've seen the film, the recent film, Three Identical Strangers, it's a really dramatic illustration of that with identical twins separated at birth and early in life. And then second, what, as I said, the nature of nurture. What looks like systematic effects are actually genetic effects in disguise. So here's one example. You all probably have heard correlation does not imply causation. Yet when we seek certain correlations, we almost can't help but interpret it environmentally. So, I mean, it raises my blood pressure to read the newspapers and especially the headlines. We, it's like a correlation between parents reading to kids and kids doing better at reading when they go to school. That's a correlation. But it's almost impossible not to interpret it to say, well, parents who read to kids make their kids better readers. But from a genetic point of view, there's a problem with that interpretation, and that is that parents and offspring are 50% similar genetically. So it could well be that parents who like to read have kids who like to read. But even more important is this nature of nurture idea. As a grandparent, I especially feel this, that we're responding to genetic differences in our kids. So if the kids really want you to read to them, you read to them. But I have one grandson who would almost be abusive if I made him sit there and read. He wants to kick a ball around. He wants to roughhouse. So I think we're responding to genetic differences in kids. So um, an implication of this, I think, is that parenting is a relationship. It doesn't mean you don't you throw up your hands and say, oh, well, it doesn't matter if I'm a parent. It matters a lot. But it's a relationship. And just as you're nice to your partner and your pets, 
And I think we want to be nice to our children because we love them. It's not because we want to mold them into be, being something we want them to be. So it's an important distinction, I think. OK, and then um, this. So I think it's a liberating message for parents. And I'll give you two more examples, schools and life events. Same sort of thing. Schools matter a lot. That's why we have universal education. We want to teach kids basic skills and enculturate them. But 60% of the differences in kids in tested educational performance is due to inherited DNA differences. The environmental effects aren't systematic. What looks like systematic effects of the environment is genetically mediated. So one example among many is you know that there's a big difference in, say, GCSE scores between kids who go to selective secondary schools and those who go to state schools. It's a correlation. And it's, it's hard not to assume that that's environmentally caused, but it isn't. If you l correct for what those kids are selected on, their previous achievement and ability, there's no difference between the, kid, the performance of kids in selective and non-selective school. It's not an environmental added effect of the schools. So I know that's a lot to take on board, too. But I'll just get to the third example here, because I really do want to stay to 20 minutes, because I enjoy the question and answer and thing a lot, a lot more than just um, talking about this. And I, it's hopeless to try and talk about this book in 20 minutes, let alone two hours. So I'm just kind of giving you the headline stories. So for education, I do think it's, it's not a policy implication, but you make better policy decisions if, with better knowledge, I would think. And so think about the topic of equal opportunity. I hope everybody understands equality of opportunity does not equal equality of outcome. Any teacher knows that standing before 30 kids. They don't all learn the same when you teach them the same. Some kids learn quickly and some don't. But furthermore, by increasing equality of opportunity, can you see that you would increase heritability? If you get rid of the environmental differences of, say, wealth and privilege and access, you're left with the genetic differences so that the genetic differences account for more of the differences in educational performance. And even more, than, well, if you can see all that, you can get an idea of why I say heritability is an index of equality of opportunity. OK, and then finally, life events matter, but they don't make a difference. So life events matter, our, spa, our relationships, our occupations. It, you might think, well, it's, partly, it's largely what makes life worth living. But they don't make a difference. There's substantial genetic influence on life events. Stuff doesn't just happen. So stuff happens to some people more than others. Even divorce, life events, you know, stress sorts of things, social support. And the environmental influences that are important are unsystematic. They're chance. Stuff happens. But we tend to bounce back to our genetic project trajectory. And that includes startling examples like people winning the lottery or the other way, accidents that cause people to be paraplegic. Those are massive environmental events. But a few years <laughs> later, people are bouncing back to where they were before, to their genetic trajectory. OK, so the summary of the first part of the book is that parents matter, schools and life experiences matter, but they don't make a difference. What matters is DNA, and that makes a big difference. So all that research has been building up, accumulating over, say, 100 years, literally. But what's new in the last few years is the DNA revolution, and that's the second part of the book, and so I'd like to talk about that now. How many people here have actually paid direct-to-consumer company for their genotyping? This looks like about eight or so. And there's many companies that do it. 20, 23andMe is uh, one of the biggest. They have about, I think, six, seven million people who have paid about 150 pounds to get their ancestry and medical genetics information. Now, most people, aren't, most people do it for the ancestry. It's really interesting because you know, we're all mongrels, and you think you're you know, purebred English or something like that. Forget it. There's no such thing, really. But the, the medical side is limited to single gene disorders for reasons I could describe. And most people don't find it very satisfactory because, fortunately, those are very rare. And that means you, know, you go, well, not very relevant to me. And the other things that you do get out of it are um, hokey little things like, can you curl your tongue? 
uh, can you taste asparagus and you know, are you a morning person or evening person? But what's new, and you don't get from these companies yet, but you will, is what I'm gonna talk to you about is polygenic scores. And they're, being, they're important to be able to predict genetic risk and prevent disorders from occurring. So the NHS is about to announce, well, the government has given 80 million to genotype 5 million people on the NHS. So instead of paying for it, you'd get this done for free, but the idea is that you would allow linkage to your NHS records, but conversely, the NHS would tell you about genetic risks that NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence says, is good to tell you about. Like, you can predict having a heart attack better with DNA than you can with anything else, including lipids and that sort of thing. And all of medicine is moving away from waiting till you have a heart attack to trying to prevent it, and to prevent, you've got to predict, and there's nothing that predicts like DNA because you can predict from birth. So some people are saying it's actually unethical that we're not doing this, letting people know that they're at risk for a heart attack. So that's why this, these polygenic scores are so important. That's why I wanted to spend a few minutes telling you what they are, because this is what it's all about. This is where the DNA revolution is going to hit the road, not just in medicine, but it, it'll spill over into all areas, like my area of psychology. And a lot of um, mental health, of course, has a burden just as great as physical health, and a lot of physical health is caused by mental health. And so this will quickly spill over into alcoholism, for example, um, obesity, and uh, mental disorders like schizophrenia and depression. So it's, it's really good to get the idea of what this is about. So the first step is you've got to get DNA. And the amazing thing about DNA is when you begin life with these three billion base pairs of DNA, half the DNA is from your mother, half from your father. That single cell with which you began life then becomes the trillions of cells that you are now. But each of those cells has just the same DNA that that original cell had. So that means that you can, two things, one is you can use this information from birth or from later in life, it's the same DNA. But the other thing is that you can get DNA from any cell in your body, hair, follicles, or skin, or um, urine, or blood. But typically, those of you who have done this know, um, you know uh, that we, um, most of the companies have you spit in a tube. So that's a little tube there, and you spit, and you get a few mils of saliva. Saliva actually doesn't have DNA. It doesn't have cells. But what it does have are sloughed off cells from inside your mouth. You know, you cut, burn your mouth or cut it. You know, it repairs itself very quickly. So all you need is one cell, and then you can amplify it and genotype the DNA in that cell. And what this is showing you um, is this is double helix of DNA, and we have one chromosome from the mother, one from the father. But the point is that 99% of our DNA bases are exactly the same for everybody in this room, but 1% differ. So what we're going to do is look at the millions of those single nucleotide, those single base pair differences called SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. So I'll avoid acronyms, acronyms but SNP is something you probably want to remember. And then when we get these millions of SNPs, like you and I differ on hundreds of thousands of these, we ask, do any of these SNPs associate with a particular trait? Are they correlated with alcoholism or do another one for schizophrenia or any trait? That's called genome-wide association. And the results are presented for the 23 pairs of chromosomes, and this is the results for, say, 3 million SNPs. Those below the line aren't significant, but above the line, we've got the significant hits. And what we've learned throughout the life sciences is genetic influence on complex traits and common disorders is not due to one, 10, 100. It's due to thousands of SNPs, of DNA differences, of tiny effect. That's been the biggest discovery in the last three years. Now, that's tough if you want to study gene brain behavior pathways. But it is what it is. What can you do with it? And that's polygenic scores. So, uh, you just simply add up all these little genetic risk factors, not like the four I show here, but real, literally ten, several tens of thousands, often 30,000, 40,000. And with that polygenic score, then, you can estimate people's individual genetic risk. 
and the, and the very important thing about it is that these polygenic scores, when we correlate them with behavior, it's one of the few correlations that are causal in the sense that nothing changes your inherited DNA sequence. So there's no backward, reverse causation. Nothing in the environment or your behavior or your brain changes your DNA sequence that you inherit. And so what that means is you can predict behavior from these DNA differences without knowing anything about what goes on in between. And for the question that always gets asked, what about epi epigenetics? Not that either, but we can talk about that. So there are um, thousands, really, of these polygenic scores throughout the life sciences for physiological, physical traits. But in psychology, these are some of the bigger ones. Most of the work has gone into mental illness like schizophrenia, but we're explaining now, I mean, about three years ago, we explained 0% of the liability. Now we're explaining about 7% of the liability. It's still a long way from the 50% heritability, but this is all happening fast, and there's new reports coming out every month on some of these things. But the amazing thing to me, and to Kevin as well, is educational achievement, which has been sort of the backwater of genetics. Nobody studied genetics and education. But it turns out it's a polygenic score predicts educational achievement better than polygenic scores predict anything else in the behavioral sciences. And this is all in the last year. So we can explain 15% of the differences between UK kids in their GCSE scores with DNA alone. Now, that's not the 60% heritability of school achievement, and it's not 100%. It'll never be 100% because these things aren't 100% heritable. It's still one of the stronger predictors we have. It's, it's a better predictor than, say, parental income. Just to get a better sense of that, though, this is my study that uh, reported this. And these are GCSE scores, and down here are the polygenic scores for my sample of 7,000 people. So what I'm doing is taking the polygenic scores predicting GCSE for 7,000 kids and dividing them into 10 equal groups of 700. And you can see across these 10 groups that there's a correlation between the average GCSE score and their polygenic score. The higher polygenic scores have higher GCSE scores. In fact, the bottom 10% have an average grade of C, and the top 10% have an average grade of A minus. So it's a big difference, even though it's only accounting for 15% of the variance. But because it's only accounting for 15% of the variance, it's not a perfect prediction. It's probabilistic. There are some kids with the lowest polygenic score that get GCSE scores of A. Very few of them, but you know, 75% gets grades of C minus or lower. But uh, similarly, on the A side, the kids with the highest top 10% scores, there are some of them that have grades as low as C. That's just because these are not perfect predictors. But you can see it's quite a powerful difference, and it's a real-world difference, because the kids in the bottom 10%, 25% of them go on to university, whereas in the top group, 75% go on. So even though it's a, you know, still a modest predictor, it's, predicting, it's one of our better predictors already. And I'm going to end by just telling you about some implications of the DNA revolution in terms of a transforming science, society, and how we understand ourselves. So it'll just be another couple minutes or so. Uh, it's, it, DNA, the DNA revolution has already transformed um, science. All major studies now, including epidemiological studies and increasingly studies in education, are getting DNA. It, it doesn't cost much to get DNA. The actual costs are on the order of 10 pounds. And this genotyping doesn't really cost that much. Um, you know, the real costs are under, 20, under 30 pounds, say, for this SNP genotyping. And it's, it's, going to, it's addressing lots of different questions. I mean, you can put a genetic angle on anything we do in the life sciences or behavioral sciences. But in medicine, the big thing is precision medicine. As I said, trying to predict problems and preventing them, but also getting away from this notion of one size fits all for anything, for heart attacks or anything, you know, it just is, it, it can't be the case. The same drug can't work for everybody. The same doses can't work for everybody. So the goal with precision medicine is to individualize treatments. And another, so that's really changing things a lot. 
But another aspect of polygenic scores that interests me is it puts the focus on dimensions rather than disorders. There are disorders like single gene disorders. If you have the gene for Huntington's disease, you'll die from Huntington's, and you won't die from Huntington's if you don't have the gene. It's necessary and sufficient. But what we're talking about with common disorders isn't like that. We're talking about traits, disorders, that are influenced by thousands of tiny DNA differences. That makes it probabilistic. And polygenic scores are always sub distributed normally in a bell-shaped curve. And that means that we all have lots and lots of genes for schizophrenia. It isn't as if there are people who are schizophrenic and people who aren't. It's a perfectly normal, continuous distribution. It's all quantitative, not qualitative. It's a matter of more or less rather than either or. And the upshot of this is to really change the way we think about diagnoses. There's no disorders to diagnose. There's just dimensions. We need to be taking a quantitative approach to this. So that's having a major impact as well. And I also like the idea that it's not like us normal people versus those schizophrenics. We all have lots and lots of genes for schizophrenia. It's a question of how many you have. And even that isn't deterministic. It's just probabilistic. It means, given the wear and tear of life, if you have a very high genetic risk score, you're more likely to be diagnosed as schizophrenia, schizophrenic or have these sorts of problems. OK, and then in terms of transforming society, I'm sure a lot of questions will, ha um, will, have, will have a lot of discussion about this, on, like parenting and education, for example. Parents are beginning to uh, get this genetic information on their kids. And I think with education, it's the same idea of precision education. Instead of a one-size-fits-all sort of curriculum, why not do what Kevin's doing in some of his work, and that is to personalize learning, especially with computers nowadays. How can you not try to use adaptive learning procedures and personalize learning to a greater extent? So I won't talk much about that, but I'll just end by mentioning how we can understand ourselves because I think a lot of people are motivated to do direct-to-consumer testing because they, it's the Delphic Oracle, know yourself, you know? And I'll use my polygenic scores as an example. I present these in the book, at the end of the book. So this is the normal distribution for body weight. BMI, body mass index, I'm sure everybody knows about that. Weight corrected for height. And here is me, you know, a bit portly, 70th percentile with a BMI of 30. So what's my polygenic score? And it's very high, 94th percentile. Now, this is a good example because people say, well, if, if, I'm, oops, if I'm a genetic fatty, I'm just going to give up and say, well, what can I do about it? But to the contrary, I find it's very motivating. First of all, I think I deserve credit for only being at the 70th percentile. <laughs> but also, it's um, motivating in the sense that I'm in, it's, a, it's a lifelong battle of the bulge. It's not the six pounds I put on every Christmas. Just I know that it's easier for me to put on weight, and it's harder for me to lose it. Now, you could say, well, just get a grip, pull your socks up, stop eating so much. Yeah, try that, though, if you're someone who is like me. It's easier said than done. And you know, so many skinny people in this audience. But um, So I think that's an example of how these polygenic scores can be useful in a preventive way with low-tech solutions, not drugs necessarily. It's just useful for me to know that. So at the end of the book, I present the world's first polygenic profile for psychological traits, and that's for me. And so these are the big ones, that, that the, the most powerful ones. And so for the affective disorders of bipolar and depression, um, well below average. The really scary one that we might want to talk about is Alzheimer's. You get this from the direct-to-consumer companies. And you could find out, if you're in the lucky, unlucky 1% of the population, instead of the 15% risk for, being, for getting dementia when you get older, it could be a 60% risk. And this is one of the reasons I'm big on the NHS doing this, because if you do it through a direct-to-consumer company, they say, well, you might want to look at this website. Goodbye. I mean, there's no support or backup. And, with that, there's nothing you can actually do now. You, you could, um, so anyway, I can go on and on about this, but I won't. I have a high score for educational achievement, and the, most, the biggest surprise for me was my high score for schizophrenia. Now, only 1% of the population is diagnosed as schizophrenic, so that's a long way from that. But it's interesting to think, what does that mean, having a high score for schizophrenia? And it means a few things, just two examples. There are three recent studies that say people in creative professions have a higher genetic score for schizophrenia. 
It doesn't mean they're schizophrenic. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm well past the age of schizophrenia, so I can tell you that I'm not. But it may be that it's part of what it's about. It's not making you schizophrenic. It's making you lots of things. It's making your brain work differently. And maybe it makes you tend to be more creative. It, you think outside the box. And maybe the problem is if you think too far outside the box, you can lose touch with reality. Um, so, in summary then, there's sort of three take-home points here today. The first is that inherited DNA differences are the major systematic force making us who we are as individuals. The second is the environment's important, but it's not what we thought it was. It's essentially random. And, and then finally, polygenic scores are going to transform science, society, and how we understand ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robert. And um, if you haven't read the book, I appreciate all Robert's work. There was a great deal to take in there. But there are some, I think if you uh, have any kind of inquiry, uh, inquiring or curious mind, there are some really big ideas to grapple with and information that we need to consider. So what we've got, we've got these questions coming up. And what I'm determined to do is not exercise too much chair's prerogative and and take over and ask questions. I've got so many I, I can ask, but I can do that separately. I will ask them if I need to. But I w I'd like to start scrolling down them, because what it seems to me when I group them is that there are, that there, there are at least three groups of questions. First is, um, so what? Well, what does this mean? W what do I do with all this information? And then there's another group that go a bit further and say, um, OK, so it's hopeless. I might as well just give up. There's no point bothering to do all the kind of stuff I do, whether it's uh, there's an example there around helping parents learn how to you know, cook better for their kids or interventions. Uh, and, 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 there's, and there's that group of questions. And then there's, um, I think I want to do the ones first, which is just going back to some of the fundamentals in the first point you, 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 you raised. And it's an anonymous question, although there's a number of people who have voted for it, which is, uh, do you think genetics determines 100% or only part of our behavior. I think we need to get back to this, the basic understanding of what it is you're saying about the role of um, genetics and obviously into polygenetics in trying to understand how much of us are we, uh, how much of our lives are, are you describing? Yeah. Well, that is a, it's such an important fundamental issue and it's very hard for people to understand that we're only talking about differences in a population. So we, I bet you'd be surprised to know everyone accepts weight, height is highly heritable. And if I ask you about eye color, you'd say, yeah. And what you mean by that is differences. Some people have blue eyes. Some people have brown eyes. And you recognize that that's due to inherited DNA differences. Height, nobody has a problem with that. But you get to weight. I bet you'd be surprised to know that weight is about 70% heritable. Now, what that means is that it's not an individual. It's not that my weight is 70% due to genes and 30% of the environment. It's about the differences in weight in people in this room and the extent to which, on average, genetic differences account for the differences we see, despite all the environmental differences that exist. Some of you, like me, are on a constant diet, for example. So there's a lot of environmental influences, but they don't seem to make as much of a difference as these inherited DNA differences. So it's describing what is, not talking about what could be. Heritability is never 100% anyway. And Okay, okay, so I, I could go on and on about that, but you want to follow up on I, that? I just, I just want to pick it up a bit further. So when you then start identifying some of the um, associations in, in, the, in, in the GWS, or you yeah. look at the polygenic associations, they're still relatively low, some of them, um, in terms of how much predictability we have around this information. Is it enough for us to um, make the case for it being or not that it's enough for us to take notice of? Yeah. Well, it's, um, I tried to emphasize that it's not 100%. It's not even 50 or 60% heritability. That's the, up, that's the ceiling, right? You can't predict more than the heritability with these things. But it's interesting, with educational achievement, three years ago, we could predict 0% of the variance. Two years ago, 1%, I think. Uh, a little over a year ago, it was like 3%. And now we're at 15%. And it's a safe prediction that in a year or two, it'll be 30%. But even with 15%, that's one of the better predictors we have. Often people don't think that way. But um, like, um, uh, as I said, parental income predicts less of the variance than that. And school quality, you know, we make a big deal about league tables. I don't know if we've talked about this, you and I, but um, how much of the variance in GCSE scores of kids can be explained by 
um, uh, Ofsted ratings of school quality? And the answer is 20% max, but then kids aren't randomly assigned to schools. And if you take into uh, account SES, you know, socioeconomic status, you're down to like closer to less than 15%. So it, relatively speaking, it's, it's a, a big predictor, but it, you know, it's, it is, it's, yeah. it's probabilistic. It, but we always make decisions on that basis. Like the best example I know of is blood alcohol levels in drinking. You know, that you think, well, how strong do you think that correlation is? You know, if, if you get, if you, you're at the legal drunk limit of alcohol, to what, uh, what's the probability you're gonna be in an accident? The answer is very low, it's a weak association. Yeah. But as a society, we say, right, but we're not gonna tolerate that. And, you know, fair enough. But it's important to know we make lots of decisions in life yeah. based on very weak associations. So let, let, let's start plowing into some of the ones that, um, I want to look at Archie's question in a moment. Um, but remember, on that schools one's very interesting that 20% of the variation between children is described traditionally between schools. And to your point, 80% of the variation is within school. And that's always been, um, it, it comes towards your point, I think, rather yeah. than as endlessly beating up schools. How do we understand it? Exactly right. Um, can we go to Archie's question? Because I think when he's getting into implications of all of this, there aren't more uh, getting behind the details of the how. And this is what you do with it all. The Archie's question is pretty straightforward, you know, what implications do you think this has for social class and mobility? Penny? Well, I, as I say, there's no necessary policy implications. You can have a, a right-wing perspective on, on heritability and say, uh, educate the best, forget the rest. From a societal point of view, that might be a cheap thing to do. It's a dumb thing to do because intellectual capital of society is what is involved in translating this into economic wealth of a society. But you could have a left-wing policy, which is sort of like a, the Finnish model, which says you recognize that some kids are going to have a great deal of difficulty learning, and instead of forgetting them, you have to put more resources into that end of the distribution. And perhaps if you can predict which kids are going to have trouble, like learning to read, you don't have to wait till they get to school and fail, but you could rather predict and intervene to try to prevent some of these problems earlier. So um, that's a very general answer to the question, but... It's a, it's a very interesting question, a challenge to those, those that are involved in research or those that are evaluating different decisions you can make in either personal or public life, because um, the precision interventions in, say, education are thin on the ground. Uh, most of what people do is either uh, intuitive or fad or fashion. We've actually seen that there's an absence of people really yeah. having a clarity about what makes the difference. And this question about how early can you make the difference we know that something like reading, it, you tend to build you know, compensatory behaviours. It gets worse than, rather than yes. catching up. So I, I, I'm very attracted by that. If, if we can have enough confidence about the information, can we therefore design things to those children who we know are going to find it hard and create protective factors? I think, yes. Is that what you're saying? Yep. And just to follow up on what you said, um, Kevin's involved with the Educational Endowment Fund that's funded 200 or so randomized control trials. But most of those are looking at average differences between yep. kids. And even if there was no average difference in a treatment, like in a randomized control trial, it could still be there's a positive effect for some kids and maybe even a negative effect for other kids. And part of that could be genetic, because genetics accounts for so much of the variance. To ignore genetics seems crazy to me. Yeah. But I think one of the questions that it, I think is alluded to in the, in, in the set, and I have to take prerogative here, is when you, take, when you think about young children or you think about the NHS, who actually owns this information? And how are we going to protect ourselves from yeah. potential misuse of the information? Yeah. Who owns this knowledge about me? Well, there's, there's a, a lot of concerns because this is new and it's big. And so it, there are concerns, and part of the reason I wrote the book is so that we start having a discussion about these issues. But on the specific issue of who owns it, who would you rather own it? A company like 23andMe that just sold the genotypes for three billion pounds to pharmaceutical companies, or the NHS? Now, the NHS is, you know, I know there's data breaches, that's a problem, but they can also be kind of the guardian of this. I mean, some of this information you might not actually want. Now, it's a question of balancing off your individual needs. If you want, it's your DNA, so you ought to be able to know what it says, but maybe you don't want to. In Finland, where they've done this now for a while, it's, it's oversubscribed. People really want to get involved in this through the health service, and there, you could find out everything, like if you went to a direct-to-consumer company, or you could say, 
You tell me what I ought to need to know. And you know, tell me things that I can do something about. So um, ultimately, I think we have to own our DNA. And, and you do, like 23andMe, you can download all the millions of SNPs on yourself and upload it to other places if you want. So to that extent, you sort of do control it to some extent. But then you sign off on these pages of agreements, like we all do, you know, to, I agree, to go on. But you set, signed off that they can use it in, anonymously for other things, like for pharmaceutical companies. Can I, going off script for a moment, colleagues, um, when, when Robert was showing that profile of himself, uh, and if after this talk, I just wonder if it was said, look, we could do this free for you now. Who would want to know that stuff? That's yeah, great. That's great. That really is great. I mean, you're, you're, not, a, you're not a representative sample, yeah. but still, yeah, it's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Who'd want to know about certain other people not too far away from here? Anyway. Um, yeah. Can I just mention, like, on that score, alcoholism isn't a good example. I mean, if you knew that you or your kid had a high genetic risk for alcoholism, it's important to know it doesn't mean they're going to be alcoholic. The, the amazing thing about it, you cannot become alcoholic unless you drink an awful lot of alcohol. But wouldn't it be useful information to know? If you and I yeah. drink as much as our friends, they might not be likely to become alcoholic, whereas we're at a greater genetic risk. Yeah. That's the way I think this will be used, with low-tech sort of solutions. And it's just knowing about yourself. I'm worried about my pleasure slipping away, Bob. But anyway, um, one, of the, um, w w one of the things in the book that you might... There's a question here from... Um, it's anonymous, so anyway. And uh, it's, um, it's a question that relates to the ugly side, the history. Uh, many of the things that you may have come to this meeting, or even as you think about the question of genetics, we, that there's a legacy, there's a history of the ugly side of eugenics and things. And you don't talk about a bit of that. How do, we, how do we face down and have the conversation about the risk of the ugly side? Yeah, well, in the paperback edition, which came out in June, there's an <coughs> afterword that talks about these sorts of issues that have come up since I published the book. And with the specific issue of eugenics in Nazi Germany, you know, the way I, I describe that is that what's interested me, this is the first public event where that's been brought up. You know, I've done probably 30 you know, public events, and the public don't seem to be concerned about right. that. I've hardly had an interview with a media person who has not brought it up. Right. Like on Hard Talk with Stephen Sacker, you know, he, he said, well, aren't you worried about the history, the eugenics history. And I think it's um, a kind of a trope that the media people use. But nonetheless, it's an, it's, it's an important issue. Um, I think modern genetics denies the reasonableness of what people were trying to do with eugenics. But the, the main point is totalitarian societies are bad. And, but they're not just genetic totalitarian societies. Yeah. Most totalitarian evil has been done through environmental theories, like Mao, Stalin, North Korea. Yeah. But there is a risk here, isn't there? I mean, if I'm thinking about, uh, in the news currently, I don't want to, why should I name an individual, but current very senior advisors in number 10 have written extensively about the value of, 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 of or, or their, their take on, on, on the information around genetics. And people, one of the questions here, which I think is a perfectly valid one, which is um, from the person who's asked most questions anonymous, which is around what, what do we do? You know, how do we protect the... If we find out about violence, for example, if we suddenly de determine there's a, uh, an association with the risk of becoming, uh, displaying violent behaviour, how do we make sure that that's handled in a way... And surely you have an obligation to be in that discussion about how do we protect this being misused as we're presenting it to people or not? Yep, well, there are problems, and it's not... You know, I'm not a policymaker, and I'm, I'm not a, an ethicist, for example, but we're trying to get this conversation going. And I think there's a lot of people who are doom mongers in the sense that they'll bring up all the concerns. I am intentionally a cheerleader saying there is an awful lot of good that can come out of this from predicting problems and preventing problems, even difficult ones like violence. So suppose the, the polygenic score for you know, the, 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 the most heritable aspect of psychopathy is callous on emotional uh, traits where kids, they're not hurting people because they like to hurt people. It's just if someone's in their way, they'll hurt them because it doesn't matter. It doesn't bother them that they're hurting people, callous and unemotional. So what if you knew, like, we've got to talk about Kevin, or, you know, the, um, it's, I think it's, it's probably got to be good to be able to say this kid is going to have a, a tendency in that direction. And can we intervene early before these patterns of behavior 
we, we'd be more concerned about that kid who then just stomps on somebody. You know, we don't just say, oh, well, he's just having a bad day. We'd be a little bit more concerned and say, no, we've got to really pay attention to that and try and change that behavior because it doesn't mean it's immutable. It just means that it's going to take more work to make a difference. One of the reasons I was so pleased to be invited to chair this is that, um, so my background is obviously cognitive sciences and education, and then you've got in the room, I guess, lots of people who might have an economist or psychologist in the room, and then, you know, this, how, do we, how do we lean in together to consider these sort of works rather than leave them in the silos of particular exactly disciplines? Right. And I think that's, that, that I, I, that, that, that's why I'm so keen to have these conversations with you. One of the um, other points I want to get to, which is slightly beyond that, is is the issue around, um, you mentioned epigenetics. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that was the flavor of the month for a little while. Uh, can you just say a little bit about that for us? OK. How many people were thinking about asking about epigenetics? Yeah. See, it's, I don't know why. It's, it's such a hot topic. But it's just gene expression, which has been around for as long as we've known about DNA. All you inherit is DNA sequence. And when we correlate differences in DNA sequence with behavior, it doesn't matter what happens in between. Yeah, the gene had to be expressed, or it might not have made a difference. But we don't need to know about mechanisms of epigenetics. And most epigenetics now um, is being viewed as a biological index of the environment. Because epigenetics, like all of gene expression, has to do with RNA, which is the messenger that translates DNA into amino acid sequences. It evolved, RNA evolved, to be sensitive to the environment, to allow you to change with your environment. Whereas DNA evolved to stay the same, to give you stability, regardless of the environment you're in. So there, we'd like to know about all the steps in between genes, gene expression, epigenetics, proteomics, all the way through the brain and behavior. It'd be great to be able to understand all those bio pathways. But the problem is, if there's tens of thousands of DNA differences, a very tiny effect, it's going to be really difficult to do that. But a lot of people are doing it. It's just that's not what I'm going to do, because I'm interested in predicting behavior and then using that to study development and interactions with the environment and that sort of thing. OK, that's, that's great. Well, I wanted to um, move on to a couple other questions. One relates to one of the critiques of the work today is that the sample from which you've gathered this information is, as you said earlier, and, and you talked about, is not the world. It's a particular sort of part of the world, in particular, that there's a whole question about race, for example, in that. Can you, can you help people understand yeah. that discussion? No, it's a really good question, really important. That you can only, as I said, describe the samples you've studied. And the studies in all of this genetic work are mostly Northern European, American, Australian, and there's some Southeast Asian. But you need very large samples to identify these tiny effects. By large, I mean hundreds of thousands, and increasingly, the currency is a million people. And the problem is, we don't have samples of a million for all the uh, different ethnic groups in the world. And there's a big emphasis now to try and do that. In the US, they've just f funded a project to get a million people who can do all the, the genotyping for free if they're from ethnic minorities. Because you're going to need large samples to do it. What we do know is that these polygenic scores based on these northern European samples do predict, say, in Southeast Asian populations, but in general, about half as well. So they're not as good predictors in these minority populations. Great. Um, Robert, I wonder if you could just turn your head to the screen point, because I, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm doing the screening here. Uh, is there a question up there that you think is particularly useful? Well, we sort of talked about that. Um, you mentioned some of the criticism of the book. I, I, I'd say I don't talk about group differences. And there's sort of three reasons for that I describe in this afterward in the paperback edition of my book. And so by group differences, we mean average differences between boys and girls and class differences and ancestry differences, ethnic group differences. And the reason I don't is that it's very, that genetics research, as I described it, is about individual differences. And it's a very powerful technique for understanding genetic and environmental influences on individual differences. It doesn't work very well for group differences. So some of the biggest gender differences we have are in my area, ADHD, autism, uh, learning disabilities. 
boys, you know, have more problems than girls. But there's no, we, how do you know if that's genetic or environmental? It's very difficult to pin that down. So we don't, they're not tractable problems. They're also politically explosive problems. But, an, but another reason is that they don't explain much variance. So, you know, we talk about girls are good in verbal, boys are good in math. How much of the variance in cognitive abilities is explained by gender? And the answer is really less than 1%. Meaning you don't know anything about a kid's verbal or math ability if all you know is they're a boy or a girl. So they're tiny differences. They're highly significant because people study huge samples of boys and girls. So that's the second reason. The third reason is I feel I don't have to study everything. I study individual differences, and I've got more than I can do. And I'm not going to take on group differences because I find they're not tractable. They're very, and, but you know, other people can try to do that if they wish. It does turn out, though, that the DNA revolution doesn't shed much light on that. You might think it would, but it's kind of a technical thing to try and explain. But I'll just assert that the DNA differences are just as difficult to use to pin down whether there's a genetic difference between, say, average group differences. And if we stay with the individual for a minute, I wonder if um, we have any insights yet around, if I know my, um, if I know these indicators, I know these scores, um, I guess it can play both ways, can't it? I look at the, uh, at what age I know the chart that you were doing, and I think, well, um, it's almost like the counter to Carol Dweck, which has been a huge influence in, in education. I, I, I'm not going to get very far intellectually. I'm, I, haven't, I haven't, so I might, why, why bother? What, what, what's, the Im, what's the impact on the individual? Positively, you describe that, but also are there risks that individuals begin to, you get self-fulfilling mm -hmm. prophecies because you see where you sit in the distribution? Yeah, well that was the example I gave with body weight, and I'm a genetic fatty, but does that mean I give up and say I can't do anything about it? No, I was trying to argue it actually goes the other way. It mm -hmm. motivates me to do it. Now, educational achievement, learning ability is a more difficult one to handle, but there's strong genetic influences there. I think it's important to recognize those differences. Not that you give up, but one of the things that's really going to be great with these polygenic scores is you'll really confront the fact that kids in a family are genetically very different. They're 50% similar, but they're 50% different. So that uh, you can get a kid who does very well at school and another sibling in the same family who doesn't. And you say, well, come on, get with it. You, know, you assume it's just motivational or something. Yeah, my brother was lazy. Yeah. But what if there's a big genetic difference between them? Yeah. And so you say, well, that's tough. But does it mean then you give up on the kid with a low genetic score. I think to the contrary, a parent would say no. It just means I have to do more work it's, there. It's that point. It's, um, it's the challenge to all of us about how ready we are and how prepared we are and have the resources and the knowledge to do the different. The, you know, we, the, this precision education places a huge, precision medicine, precision education, places a huge demand on those that serve in education um, because knowing it um, is one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. acting on it is another, so that, that, that it creates a new demand, which I think is, is absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. But isn't one of these companies you're working with now the, what is it, re questions? What is Learning that? by questions. That, that's using technology. There's the, yeah. that, that's the big debate in education about the value of technology in, in, at the individual level to give immediate feedback to children as they respond to tasks rather than waiting and all the it's rest of it. It's adaptive learning. And yeah, that it's sort adaptive of thing, in so the learning at the individual level. Yeah. So this I mean, personalization. How can it not be a good thing? I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, how can it not be a good thing? It cannot be a good thing if you, if you somehow start uh, sending the message that the basic relationship between the teacher and the child is fundamental and that the teacher mm -hmm. uh, has to adapt their teaching to meet the needs of all children and don't try and find or identify, um, the wrong word's excuse, uh, but you go back to, well, it was the child, it's not me. I did, it, I've, I, you know, I, well, I've looked at my register, I've got all these scores, and I've got too many of them. You know, you, you've, you've, we, we've got to be ready to have the debate in a way, and I'm excited by it, as you know, yeah. but have the debate in a way which allows us to, to meet the challenge, but I, to present the challenge. I think, you know, what sense does it make for a teacher to stand up in front of a classroom and deliver lectures that bore half the kids and over the yeah. head of the others? Why not free teachers up to do that, just that? to work with kids on a more personalized basis, dealing often more with their social behavioral problems than their actual learning problems. Yeah. So I, there is still, as you say, though, great resistance to this, but I don't get it. Yeah. 
Um, and, 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 you know, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about it. I just want to say, I just want to do two more questions. Um, there's something from Anonymous again. This person's been incredibly busy. <laughs> and it's about um, going back to the polygenetic scores. And the, you talk about the, um, reflect the presence of genes or are genes that are being expressed as individuals. Let me find that question so you can see the wording of it, Robert. It uh, came in at 5.16. Someone, someone will throw it up. It, it doesn't, me touching this doesn't, is it, I didn't realize that's how it works, well, sorry. Yeah. It, oh, got it now? No, I, it, it, I Do didn't. you want to just read it to me? I'll read it to you. Um, so we're going back to polygenetic profiles, sorry, polygenetics. And it's polygenic, just so we, I'm just, yeah. I'm just, yeah, I'm just trying to find it. I'm reading what was written rather than. No. Um, but you want to be cool when you're at a cocktail party saying, oh, what about polygenic scores? It's on the screen. Polygenic profiles. So how do you prevent people, organization, government from limiting, that's a different question, but it's the same theme, limiting people's opportunities of freedoms? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like any information, all your health information. Yeah. I mean, insurance companies can get that. And, you know, I think one of the great things about polygenic scores in the NHS is it could be the salvation of the NHS. But in your community, are you... In uh, you, you're telling us that reports are endlessly coming out, and your community is busy with this new technology and these new access, just, just grinding away at these numbers and getting more and more numbers. What's the conversation about the risk? What is the conversation you're having, the, the obligation and responsibility within that community? Well, I mean, most, you know, there's always the rights of society to balance and the individual. Um, but uh, in general, I feel that forewarned is forearmed and knowledge is power and most people want to know about these things. But um, what about governments? Well, governments shouldn't do this. You know, should they, when it goes on the NHS, they're not going to come down and say, okay, we're going to lock you in a closet and not give you high energy foods because you're going to be obese. I think it's, it's, you've got to assume that the government's going to try to help you because the NHS can save a lot of money if they're able to prevent the problems, cardiovascular, uh, type 2 diabetes that come from obesity. So I think they should be well motivated to do this. And I do want to mention that one of the fantastic things is if you have a, a, a health insert, a system that's governed by insurance, as in the United States and other places, I don't see how they can survive the DNA revolution. Because if you knew you were at genetic risk, you could get insurance. They're not supposed to discriminate against you. It's very likely to happen that they could, though, getting a hold of this sort of information. And then they'd say, well, we can't insure you because you're going to cost us too much money. So I think it's really good to do this on the NHS. And I don't know if you, it depends on your view of the government. Is the NHS going to somehow uh, limit your opportunities, the way this is being funded, the, the gist up in the several meetings, it's to say people are excited about the possibility for helping people. But what's, what's great about these questions, and the reason that I've made it on them is that what, but that's what most of the questions are, well, a, lot, a large number of the questions are about, is that it, it kind of feels, therefore, that what we're doing is saying, we buy the science, we buy the information. There's more of that to do. This is really exciting. There's huge kind of uh, potential in here. But... We're also wary, people are wary of the, of the risks, and we need to be very thoughtful and mindful of that. And that's not, mm -hmm. it's not griping, it's not kind of moaning mm -hmm. about, it's actually saying this is, a, this is fundamental to the quest. Absolutely. And that needs to be um, and, as, and as, that's, as... Yeah, and that's why I've said that, you know, part of the reason I wrote this book is to have this discussion and to get people talking about these issues, because this is really happening. Yeah. So we really do have to talk about these issues. The other thing I said, though, is there's an awful lot of people pointing out all the, all the possible dangers. And as you say, that's fine, that's legitimate. But I want to be a cheerleader and emphasize this is the biggest thing that's come down the line in a long time. When Matt Hancock, the NHS secretary, um, health secretary, had a, had a meeting earlier this year where we talked about the big innovations coming up in health. The first one was robotics, like robotics. The second one was AI. The third one is polygenic scores. But you think about AI and um, robotics. This is hugely expensive. There's lots of possibilities for going wrong. Polygenic scores are so cheap, it's not to be believed. And they're there. This technology is yeah. here right yeah. now. Yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, I, 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 I'm with you. I think this is, this is the frontier of something that's a very transform education as well, potentially. Um, and I'm really pleased that we had the person who's been leading the way to help us come and understand a bit more about it. So thank you, Robert. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Great. Thank you.